So I just wanted to film a quick video discussing the different types of vitamin C. So I think everybody knows that ascorbic acid is like the true pure form of vitamin C. And then there's a bunch of different derivatives around that are trying to make serums either more just sensorial to use or more gentle on the skin. It makes vitamin C a little bit tricky to compare or at least compare between products because like a percentage of ascorbic acid doesn't really correlate to a percentage of a vitamin C derivative. So it is hard to kind of gauge different strength, different qualities, different efficacy. Um, so unfortunately with vitamin C, it's a little bit of like you have to try the product to know, but I guess that's true of skincare in general. And I feel like most people consider vitamin C derivatives to be more like of a promising type ingredient where there's probably some action, but maybe just not to the level of actual ascorbic acid. I think it's worth noting as well that in some markets, I think it's like Korea and Japan, vitamin C derivatives hold like a status outside of standard cosmetics. So it's like quasi drug in Japan and I think functional cosmetic in Korea. That means that a lot of these ingredients, although they're kind of brushed off in a lot of Western countries, they actually have much more clinical standing in other places in the world. So that gives me more confidence that they do actually work. And also it's worth noting that brands do choose a particular vitamin C derivative for a reason. They're not just throwing things together willy nilly. There's always like a purpose for their selection. Some brands are in intentionally aiming for a gentler experience and you can really only achieve that with a derivative and different vitamin C derivatives have different properties in a formula so some of them will be more watery allowing for a lighter texture others will be more oily so they really suit creams emulsions or just heavier textures so all of these things come into play when a formulator is choosing to work with a certain vitamin C derivative or depending on the brief that a brand has given in terms of the texture they're trying to achieve. So I'll start with the pure vitamin C, ascorbic acid, and this is considered to be the most active form of vitamin C. It's known to work well as an antioxidant, to help brighten skin, to assist pigmentation, and even to stimulate collagen. The downside is that it's generally unstable in formulation, and it generally carries the highest risk of irritation potential. But having said that, it's still probably considered the best. I think it truly requires thoughtful formulation, but also a lot of know-how for packaging stability as well. Because ultimately we all want sustained activity in the skin, but also shelf life. We all know that ascorbic acid is known to oxidize quickly, rendering it less effective. I think the degree at which the effectiveness of a vitamin C serum drops when it starts to oxidize is a little bit unknown. So I'm not sure that it's like useless. It's probably just that the efficacy is reduced over time. Truthfully, I think a lot of brands probably don't invest as much money and time into developing packaging to assist with stability. They're kind of just using generic packaging. It's probably the most cost effective, you know, which is fine, but it means from a consumer perspective, we're having to rebuy these serums probably before we actually finish them. Um, and that's why I'm a big fan of derivatives in some cases or, or purchasing from brands that actually focus on stability, not only from formulation, but also packaging like Pons from the lab and even the Milano CC. The next vitamin C I'll discuss is the gold conjugated ascorbic acid. This is relatively new. I think it came out in 2019. I consider this one to be essentially like an encapsulated form of vitamin C that combines ascorbic acid with colloidal gold particles and glutathione. This ingredient tends to be used in fairly small concentrations. And I think the supplier suggests usage from like 0.3% in a very, very low range. The whole idea of this encapsulated system is that it's supposed to achieve a more targeted delivery into the skin. But a lot of this information that we have is just based on supplier data so it's not as robust as having like clinical evidence. The nice thing about this derivative is that it's supposed to maintain 100% stability for at least six months and also it's known to be very gentle on the skin because of the encapsulation brands aren't limited by a certain pH range so generally you'll find that serums can have a more skin friendly pH while still using this version of ascorbic acid in the serum. One other downside to consider about this version of ascorbic acid is that a lot of the supplier information seems to be comparing the gold conjugated ascorbic acid to regular ascorbic acid but in fairly low percentages so when we use a typical ascorbic acid serum it's usually 10 percent 15 percent but i haven't seen anything comparing 
the gold ascorbic acid to regular ascorbic acid at like a like for like percentage. So it makes it even harder to ascertain what the differences in efficacy might be. But I don't really love to overthink these things. It's not really my place. You know, that's very much for a formulator to discern. And ultimately the reason you'd gravitate towards a serum using gold conjugated ascorbic acid is because you're trying to avoid irritation. So that's a huge plus. Next one on the list is THD or tetrahexyl decal ascorbate. I think is how you say it. This is a more stable oil soluble derivative of vitamin C and it's also thought to have good skin penetration capabilities. For all intents and purposes this version of vitamin C is supposed to have very similar claims to regular ascorbic acid. However there's this skincare brand called Exponent Beauty and they claim that 1% of THD is equivalent to 0.16% of ascorbic acid which basically implies the need for much higher levels of THD to get similar results to a regular ascorbic acid serum. Now I think this is based on their own comparative methodology where they've done like their own testing around this so I'm not sure how reliable that information is considering they're a skincare brand themselves. So take that comparison with a bit of a grain of salt but it's really the only information I've found that compares those ingredients direct. Exponent also makes another claim where they say that THD begins to lose potency after eight weeks, which in my opinion isn't that great if it's true because the whole reason I'd reach for a derivative like this is hoping for better longevity in a product formula. But if it starts to break down kind of as quickly as regular ascorbic acid does, that's not ideal. But again, that's just one brand making those claims. I haven't really seen anything to confirm that level of degradation. The next one is ascorbyl tetra isopalmitate. Oh my God, these names are going to kill me. This is a lot like THD, if not the same. Cypher Skincare actually has a great description on their website that suggests that a lot of suppliers actually sell ATIP and THD interchangeably and within cosmetic formulation there's something known as a CAS number which is like a identifying serial number for each cosmetic ingredient. Apparently these ingredients ATIP and THD actually share the same CAS number. Cypher says apparently this is being changed soon to differentiate them because there's a little bit of a molecular difference between these ingredients as in like their chemical structure is slightly different but supposedly they have almost identical effects in the skin. Cypher actually claims that ATIP costs a little bit more to buy from like a brand perspective and that it's usually supplied with more substantiation so whether that means ATIP is a little bit better or has a bit of an edge just because it has a bit more efficacy data I'm not sure I feel like most people consider these ingredients being ATIP or THD pretty similar the next ingredient is sodium ascorbyl phosphate and this one has been around for ages I feel like a lot of us would be familiar with it this is a more stable water soluble derivative of vitamin C this is thought to be far less irritating than than the others and also great for sensitive skin. Interestingly, sodium ascorbyl phosphate carries a reputation of being especially appropriate for acne prone skin. Apparently it can work quite well on inflammation and it's also known to still have antioxidant properties. The next one is magnesium ascorbyl phosphate. This is often grouped in with sodium ascorbyl phosphate and I consider them quite similar ingredients. From what I understand, magnesium ascorbyl phosphate is probably known to have a little bit more collagen inducing properties. And it's also known to be a little bit more stable in formulation than a sodium ascorbyl phosphate. Now, a lot of these things that I'm mentioning are just very general thoughts. Um, obviously an overall formula matters more and brands can stabilize vitamin C in many different. So just consider this more of a general overview. The next, next one is ascorbyl glucoside. This is a water soluble version of vitamin C linked to glucose. This has a reputation reputation of being like a gradual release version of vitamin C so it's supposed to impact the skin more slowly. This one is considered a good option for sensitive skin and it's mainly a situation where you'll probably see benefits but over an extended period of time. Next one is ethylated ascorbic acid. This is also known to be a highly stable derivative of vitamin C with good skin penetration capabilities and the effects are supposed to be very similar to ascorbic acid. It has become a very popular derivative with lots of brands. It's just everything that I can see is very much based in supplier data. So there's just not very much 
clinical comparison, I guess, versus ethylated ascorbic acid and real ascorbic acid and how that works in like real world use. Exponent Beauty, again, who were critical of some of the other derivatives, they say this is probably the most similar to ascorbic acid in a derivative form. And they and it's even the most like for like in terms of like equivalency of percentages. I also wanted to touch on the whole concept of proprietary vitamin C or where brands don't disclose percentages and just open up the discussion to the fact that brands aren't actually required to disclose percentages. They're allowed to keep this blend or the way they develop a formula a secret. I know from a consumer perspective, it can be a bit frustrating because we're trying to compare products and brands and to understand the strength. But because so much goes into a formula that can impact those things, like the pH of a product, whether they've added other skin soothing, skin conditioning ingredients, it can influence so much. It's actually really difficult to properly compare ingredients without trying them. So I sort to feel like percentages are nice to know but they certainly won't deter me from trying a product if the percentage is not disclosed. Now just to go over a bit of a list as to why some brands don't disclose percentages. It might be for proprietary reasons because they're more focused on an overall blend in their product and how vitamin C maybe forms a complex of some sort with other ingredients that they're using. Some brands hide percentages because they're more focused on the stability of packaging as well. So you could have a really high percentage vitamin C and really bad packaging that might lose efficacy really quickly versus another vitamin C product with maybe a lower percentage, but because the packaging is so much better, it ends up being a more value for money and a more effective product over time. Some products aren't specifically designed to be just a vitamin C serum. So they might be using say niacinamide or alpha arbutin or a few other key ingredients to form an overall pigmentation serum. So that way knowing the percentage of any one ingredient again, isn't that helpful. Some brands are using delivery systems or encapsulated forms of vitamin C that require much, much lower inputs of vitamin C. So again, that's something that's not really useful information for consumers because we're not on the formulating side of things. And with that in mind, that usually means that the percentages of encapsulated forms don't relate to unencapsulated forms at all. And I kind of think that declaring a percentage on a label is the easy way to go. Sometimes a product is more well designed, more refined, more well made, just more well tested when they don't disclose percentages because it likely means that something is going on as far as the entirety of a product and not an ingredient in isolation. I very much believe in the synergy of ingredients together, not any one ingredient doing all the heavy lifting unless it's maybe a tretinol. Now along similar lines, the whole concept of like a complex or a blend of ingredients does make it trickier to understand some labels. The Misha, for example, they say that they're using 30% of a vitamin C liposome complex, which to a regular consumer probably doesn't mean much, or it makes it look like they're actually using 33% vitamin C, which sounds super intense and super high. And you know, they probably do this on purpose because it makes their product seem like it would be much more efficacious. But in reality, when a brand is talking about a complex or a blend or a liposomal delivery or something like that, it usually means the actual amount of the active within that complex is quite low. So sometimes it's 1%, 2%, if not less and everything else of that 33% might be water or thickeners or some uh, something else to protect the molecule from degradation. So I love a complex and I love a blend and I love when, and I love when brands actually talk about using these technologies in their skincare. I just think highlighting the percentage is a little bit iffy because again, it makes it sound like 33% is so high and other brands are only using 15%. But if one brand is using 15% of true ascorbic acid versus 33%, percent of a liposomal clump complex and the actual results and efficacy and even just user experience is going to be widely different. So yeah, I hope that overview made sense. Again, it was just a very general surface level explanation. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comments and I'll see you in the next video.